Welcome to my house. Welcome to the Structure Talk podcast, a production of Structure Tech Home Inspections. My name is Ruben Saltzman. I'm your host, alongside building science geek, Tessa Murray. We help home inspectors up their game through education, and we help homeowners to be better stewards of their houses. We've been keeping it real on this podcast since 2019, and we are also the number one home inspection podcast in the world, according to my mom. Welcome back to the Structure Talk podcast. Tessa, great to see you. You know, I had to record a show last week all by my lonesome, Tess. I am so sorry I had to leave you, Ruben. And I was so excited about that topic and the guest that you had on. And I haven't listened to it yet. But um, for anyone that missed it, it, you were talking about stucco and the new technology with, I guess, ways to paint it. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's not even called a paint. Now I don't even remember what it's called. It's like a <laughs> concrete and masonry coating or something like that, but nowhere on the package does it say paint, but uh, yeah, really cool product. Check that out. Interesting. You, you have options. You don't, uh, you don't paint stucco, but there is a way to make it look painted and the mm-hmm. house looks bright and shiny and new. I had family over the other day for dinner and everybody was like, whoa, what did you do? It looks new. And I was like, yes. Yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's <laughs> I'm awesome. Glad somebody noticed because it was a big project. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So welcome back, Tess. Glad to have Thank you here. You? It was a short show, by the way. I didn't, I don't know. When you're on, you've just got better questions than I do. I had all the questions kind of laid out that I wanted to ask. We got through all the questions and I was like, all right, that's a show. 23 minutes. And we're done. <laughs> Well, you're being kind, Ruben. I don't know about better questions, but let's just say more questions. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you've got that good natural curiosity. All right. So we got a guest today, but before we get into the show, I, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, IEB, Inspector Empire Builder. It's a inspector coaching and consulting group, peer-to-peer group that we joined back in 2019. Tons of super helpful information. We have four in-person, uh, or no, excuse me, two in-person masterminds every year, and then two all-day remote masterminds every year. And I always get a ton of information from those. Always look forward to them. And we got weekly coaching calls. We got monthly specialized calls. You know, a call maybe on your business financials, a call on growth, calls on all different types of things. Whatever you can imagine, we got it covered. So if you want to learn more about them and you're a home inspection company, uh, check it out at, uh, well, we'll have the link in the show notes. I don't, I'm not, I don't need to call it out. So thank you to our sponsors. Without any further ado, today's topic is, a, this one's been a long time coming. We yeah. heard about this big legal settlement involving the National Association of Realtors Many months ago, it was earlier on in the year, yeah. and a lot of people have been talking about how this is going to change real estate forever. I've been reading news headlines saying, you know, real estate's never going to be the same. This is, you know, this is a big disruptor and uh, get ready for big changes. And then, and then I've heard other stories. I, I, I've heard from a lot of people in the real estate profession saying, meh. You know, it's gonna it's gonna change. We're gonna have another box we gotta check. There's another form people gotta fill out. Man, that's about it. Nobody's really gonna notice a difference. So I've heard both sides of the spectrum. I have no idea what is gonna happen with these changes, but they have taken effect at this point. And I, I Tess, I didn't want to have anybody on the podcast to speculate and postulate and say, well, this is what I think. I thought, let's wait until it goes into effect and let's chat with the professional after we've been in this for a little bit. So today I got Michael Bardis on the show, friend of mine. He's a realtor. He's been at this for, what? Michael, how long have you been doing real estate? 50 years, 60 years? (laughs) Uh, So I'm 50. Four, and I had my real estate license when I was 21. So I'm pretty close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. Uh, but full time for about 20 years. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, wow. Welcome to the show, Michael. Michael is a repeat guest. 
Uh, can't even remember what we've had him on the show to talk about in the past, but whatever it was, it was good stuff. He's always got good insight. I'm sad, I'm sad you don't remember, but I said, don't buy a house. I, oh my gosh. Who could forget that one, Michael? Yeah. What year was that, Michael? You remember? Boy, that was like four or five years ago. Was Back it when that we, long? Oh was my it gosh. Right when COVID hit, maybe? Yeah, it was kind of around that time. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe three years ago, but I remember mm-hmm. that. And then I also did uh, tips to buy and sell during winter. Yes. Ah, yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, well, I'm so glad to have you on, Michael, because we have been talking about this um, for a long time, Ruben and I. And so we've got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. But, but before we get into it, Michael, can you tee it up better than I did? Because I just, I, I mean, I just glossed over it. Um, for anybody who's been living under a rock or, or just isn't involved in real estate news, what what happened? Tell us, tell us a story, Michael. Sure. And I'll be honest, I've kind of had my head under the sand because I wanted to wait to see if it actually happened, you know, and the settlement did happen. So I've had to kind of scramble to to get caught up to speed on everything. But the really kind of the gist of it is that uh, it was decided that real estate brokerages need to decouple their commissions, meaning historically sellers have paid buyers agents or buyers brokerages commissions, and it's been bundled together. So let's just say a 7% commission was collected from a seller, it would be like 4% on the listing side, and then let's say 3% to the buyer's uh, side. And then on the MLS, it was advertised that the buyer agent would get that 3% commission. And that's just the way it's been for a really, really long time. It was determined that that uh, violated antitrust, uh, the Sherman Act. So Hmm. um, a large uh amount of brokerages out there have settled uh and the national area association of realtors have settled uh with these lawsuits and uh there's only been a handful of other larger brokerages that have not agreed to settle and uh we won't get into that but um it it's changed forms it's changed how us realtors are going to interact with sellers and buyers and we really need to treat buyers and sellers as two separate entities and, and more so now than ever. And can I ask you too, Michael, has it been kind of a standard too in, in the real estate industry that there's kind of a set fee or set commission that's just been assumed? And that's usually like a, you know, maybe a 6% or in your example, you said 7%. And is this lawsuit kind of changing that standard too? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's always, commission has always been negotiable, right? So if I were to meet with you guys and say, hey, Tessa, um, you're looking to sell your home. You know what? You could sell your house yourself. You don't need to use a realtor necessarily. Uh, You could use a flat rate brokerage that charges just the flat rate to sell your house and put you on the MLS. That's different than a 6 or 7% commission. But- Mm -hmm. The large brokerages in general over time, you know, have been at anywhere from five to seven percent. That's just kind of the way it's been. Just like in mm-hmm. your industry, you probably have a general range of what is charged for an inspection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's always been negotiable, but what this what this lawsuit has kind of said is you know what? You really didn't make it negotiable. You you kind of yeah. forced the hand of the seller to pay the buyer's agent commission. So it's kind of like, I've been trying to figure out, okay, how do I make sense of this outside of my industry or our industry? Yeah, It'd be kind of like a defend, a plaintiff paying for a defendant's um, court or legal fees. Yeah. Why would yeah. you pay someone to negotiate against me? Mm. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Because a seller yep. is paying a buyer's agent, right? So why do I want to pay you 
so you can beat me up on my sales price. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a sense. lawsuit essentially. And it, and it was deemed that real estate brokerages are overcharging people because of this. Hmm. And, okay. and that's where everyone gets upset. I, I've been reading a lot online uh, about, you know, some of the attorneys involved in this and then the realtors lashing out saying, well, what did you charge for the lawsuit? Did you guys charge 6% or did you have a 40% uh, you know, legal uh, huh. fee mm-hmm. of the settlement? So mm-hmm. is that overcharging people? You mm-hmm. know, so, you know, it's all what someone's willing to pay mm-hmm. and, you know, and we probably as realtors probably should have done a better job explaining some of these things to our clients, both on the buyer side and the selling side. But, you know, like we've had a crazy real estate market, right, over the last few years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, buyers don't want to lose out on houses. So things are moving really, really quickly. And maybe you don't have all the time to explain to people every little word in a contract, mm-hmm. you know, which we should be doing and we should be sitting down with people. But with the internet, it's made everything so fast, you know, with, yeah. you know, the real estate portals that we set our clients up with and being able to do digital documents. And, you know, I'm doing deals at 10 o'clock at night and people are half asleep, you know, just to try to get them a house. But mm-hmm. what these, lawsuits are going to do is it's going to really slow everything down, which I think is really good for the industry. People really should know what they're doing, what they're signing. Um, And I can give some examples of, you know, just something I ran into recently. I, I, I had someone call me on one of my listings, right? I've been hired by my seller to sell their house, right? So if, if a buyer calls me off the internet or a sign, and says, I want to, can I see your listing? Can I see your property? Of course you can. I'd, lo- I'd love you to see it. I'd love to sell it because my sellers want to sell. You maybe want to buy. So let's get you into that house right away. Okay, that's the old mindset. Now I have to go, I have to say time out, Michael. Nope, you, you can't quite do that. Now you need to explain a little bit more that they need to have a buyer representation agreement before I can show any house, including my own listing. Mm. So I call that person back and say, I know you don't know me. I don't know you either, but we need a buyer rep agreement in place before I can show you my listing. And it got so convoluted to try to explain this over the phone. Um, They ended up not doing it and I didn't show the house. So, so my Ugh. sellers missed out on an opportunity to maybe sell their house. Now, I don't know if this was a plant. Maybe it wasn't really a buyer. I, I don't know. I don't know who this person was. Oh, someone just like testing you to make sure you're following the rules. Yeah, I've heard oh. that there's federal agents in town that are posing as uh, buyers to try to trip us realtors up to make wow. sure we're doing our job with explaining agency and dual yeah. agency and that you need a form because there's, there's fines involved. You can, I, I, I don't know all, all what the consequences are, but I believe it's a thousand dollar fine and then probably eventually losing your real estate license. So, so it's, it's not worth losing your license or paying a thousand dollar fine to have some random person call you to show the house, you know, um, yeah. so the way around it. So this is the thing we as realtors are, we're, we're trying to get creative here with trying to work within the parameters of the industry well, I could have said, hey, Mr. Buyer, it's 10 a.m. right now. I'm going to do a public open house today from noon to one. And if you just want to show up during that time, it's open to the public and you can just kind of stroll right in. Yeah. Yeah. And now I don't need a buyer rep agreement in that situation from what I understand. <laughs> I was just going to ask you about that exact thing to see if you could do that. Okay. Yeah. Very creative. So I- Loophole. Right. So what I try to do is um, if, if buyers do call me about properties, I will let them know like, hey, there is a public open house. It, you know, if you have a realtor, please let me know, whatever. Um, I want to respect those relationships. But, hey, I'm having an open house this Sunday. If you happen to be in the area, why don't you come there? And then you don't have to worry about, you know, signing a contract at this point. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this uh, this extra documentation that's required, it, it's basically like an agreement that a, a potential buyer would have to have with the seller's agent or with their agent, their buyer's agent. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a little tricky. So not so if you're a, let's say you test you're a buyer mm-hmm. and you want me to represent you in a transaction, um, I would recommend that you and I sit down and and we talk about the paperwork. Uh, together, but it's completely negotiable how you and I work together. So huh. if you're more comfortable paying me an hourly rate of $150 an hour, uh, we could negotiate that. If you want to pay me a percent of the sale, y- you could do that. Like it's normally, wow. bad, but it's usually paid by the seller. Right. Uh, so there, there's, it's basically all negotiable. So everything's wow. negotiable now on the seller side and the buyer side. So Hmm. You know what? It's kind of fun, but it's kind of the wild west. Yeah. And so trying to navigate this, it you know, and I'm still navigating it. I don't consider myself an expert. I just got this kind of dumped on me and I'm I'm trying to figure it out too. So yeah, you know, what I'm saying hopefully is accurate. Uh, I'm still learning everything about it. But the bottom line is is that we need to slow down. We need yeah. to talk openly to our yeah. buyers and sellers about how compensation is, is right. being handled. And yeah. you have to figure out that commission percentage or hourly rate or whatever it is before you even go look at a house with a client. Yeah. And that's what's tricky is, you know, you don't go on a first date and marry the person, right? <laughs> I mean, Let's like, sign the screen up here. <laughs> yeah, unless it's a yeah. prearranged marriage or something like that. But that's, you know, that violates, you know, antitrust if you do. So, so anyway, yes, Ruben. Well, so what what exactly are they signing? What does it say? Buyer representation agreement. And but and but just help me understand what does that mean? I mean, does that mean that if they buy a house anytime within the next X number of years, that they are agreeing that you are going to represent them? I mean, how do they get out of it? How long is it for? What what are the I tell me more. Yeah, it's all negotiable. So, you know, if you're like Michael, I don't really know you. And and I don't really know them. And we just want to do a one-time showing agreement. So like in the case where that person called me on the phone, mm-hmm. I explained to them that we could just do a one-time showing agreement. So, you know, if if we meet each other at the house and you like the house, you want to make an offer, you would agree to pay, you know, X, you know, some compensation. But, you know, again, we didn't sit down to negotiate that. So I don't even know, you know, what that would have been. But let's just say we did. Um, we could negotiate how the terms, any of the terms are negotiable. So length of contract, uh, how much I get paid, our broker gets paid, you know, that sort of thing. So I this seems very, I mean, this just seems like a, you know, this is really going to be a challenge for the real estate industry. I think trying to navigate this, it sounds like you're, I mean, you've been in this industry a long time and you're still trying to wrap your head around it and figure out what's going on and, and how to handle it. And, and how to the tough part is how to educate the buyer or the seller around all these things too. And do you have any advice like for a potential buyer in this market of what you'd recommend how they how they handle it? Like what's like what are some some um I guess some information you think that'd be helpful for someone looking to buy a house right now? Well, you can definitely go to the consumer advocates in American real estate. Uh, website. Um, you can also go to the National Area Association, National Area Association of Realtors website. Those are both two good resources uh, as a consumer to go to and, and kind of find out about what's going on and kind of what your rights are and, and what what's negotiable, what's not. But here's the thing, and this is where you know I'm kind of struggling too. Is um, you know I'm used to a certain range of commissions and, and, and getting paid a certain kind of way. Um, what I want to do might be different than the next realtor. So I would just say, find a realtor that is willing to do what you want to do. Cause yeah, you're not holding the gun in anyone's head. If you want to work with me, this is what I'm willing to do and what I'm <laughs> willing to work for. But you might have another agent who's willing to maybe let's say work for less. Hey, if, yeah. that's, if that's important to you, you know, I feel like, you know, my years of experience and my dad being a builder and realtor, 
I, I think I have a lot of high value in what I offer, but you might have a brand new realtor that doesn't have the experience that might be willing to, you know, work for a flat rate or whatever. You know, that's up to you, the consumer, to negotiate that. So, wow. Michael, help me just let, let me explain it and correct me where I'm wrong here. The way it used to work is you'd have a listing. And there would be information hidden in the agent notes that nobody except for agency. And it it says, um, if you bring a buyer to this house, you get 3% commission. It's already set up and it comes out of, it comes from the the person selling the house. They're the ones who pay both sides. Correct. The way it's set up now is that you have an agent make an arrangement with the seller that says, I'm going to sell your house for this much money, this much commission, whatever. They make they make an arrangement, and then there is no predetermined arrangement for what the buyer's agent gets, and all of that is up in the that's air. Not, that's not necessarily true. Okay, all right. Um, so in the new listing agreement, uh, exclusive right to represent, sellers, you can kind of choose your own adventure. So you can do the way that we used to do it, which would be the seller basically says to the listing agent, I want to do it the old way. I want your brokerage to pay the buyer's agent brokerage directly and take it out of net proceeds. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Um, Or they can say, I want to pay, I, the seller, want to pay the buyer's brokerage directly and allow the buyer to negotiate in the offer how compensation is handled. So we added a new line in the purchase agreement that talks about how that gets handled. Now, if, and if what's tricky and I, I don't have it handy on me, but it basically says, so let's just say you're a seller and let's say we agreed on 7% commission and it's 4% on the, on the listing side, it's 3% on the buyer rep side. And, and the seller says, yep, I like that. That's how I want to handle it. Um, if a purchase agreement comes in and let's say the realtor wrote in additional compensation in the offer we're hearing stories of sellers on the hook for 10 percent commission because it says in addition to what's been agreed to in the listing contract so if i'm talking seven percent and in the offer you wrote three percent depending on how you wrote it sellers could be on the hook for even more now the way it all trickles down Mm. They probably wouldn't be, but contractually they might be. So wow. you just have to be super duper careful. Again, it's you got to slow down, explain things, read things, uh, make sure you check the right boxes. Uh, don't be sloppy. Uh, the days of just writing a purchase agreement in five minutes, you know, are over. <laughs> yeah. So you really got to slow down. Yeah. And make sure. So now what's happening is. If I'm going to show a listing, you know, I have to have the buyer rep agreement in place. I also have to now contact the listing broker if I want to know if there's going to be any compensation paid to our brokerage directly. And then we sign a cooperating brokerage agreement between each other for compensation to make sure that I'll get paid. Our brokerage will get paid from the seller directly. If they say no, the the seller isn't offering a, a fixed commission or anything like that, then I have to negotiate that in the purchase agreement. Mm. So it's requiring uh, another step for the realtor if they want to figure out what they make. And then uh, you gotta you gotta go back to the person who would be potentially buying the house and you gotta say, hey look, the seller isn't gonna pay me anything. Uh but this is what I charge. So now you're gonna right. have to pay me, right? Exactly. And that's kind of you know, historically, we've always kind of known, like I could go on the MLS and like you said earlier, I could look on the MLS and say, wow, okay, um, this is a national builder. They're paying me a flat rate of 2%, let's say. 
whereas an existing home might be paying me 3%, you know, so um, now that's over. We, we cannot advertise any commissions on our MLS anymore. Mm-hmm. We can advertise, from what I understand, we can advertise seller concessions, which could be like commission or uh, closing costs paid by the seller. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, it's kind of my understanding that so so NAR is this gigantic organization, National Association of, of Realtors, that's kind of been setting the rules for like a hundred years in this country. Right. And right. they they basically own MLS and and they control a lot of different aspects of this whole real estate industry and a huge percentage of uh, real estate agents are members of NAR and it's, it, I mean, it gives you access to the lockbox and MLS and all these things. So it's, it's been really hard, I think, in this, in this industry as a real estate agent to be a real estate agent, be successful and not be a member of NAR, correct? So right. most agents have been, and they kind of just set these rules of like, this is how it's going to work. And this is like this kind of standard commission that sellers will pay out. And it's just kind of, you know, this deal is done. And, and so this lawsuit really, it was like, okay, well, NAR, you've kind of been this monopoly that's set, found guilty of price fixing. And uh, we're going to break up that monopoly now and give the power back to the people to negotiate their own, you know, payouts, I guess, to the real estate agents. And how do you think that's going to change this, this real estate industry? Like, what's it going to look like in the next five, 10 years? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. question. And, and that's where the antitrust thing kind of came about, right? Because they're basically accusing NAR of creating the environment or the framework for in which realtors operate under and that and that the sellers just pay the buyer's agent commission and that's just the way it is. You know? Yeah. When we uh I remember a million years ago when I went to real estate school, we used to talk about the real estate commission and it's like, well, how does you know how does this all work? And one of the instructors said, well, it's kind of like the real estate commission is up in the attic Uh to kind of create a visual and that the money is just kind of up there as commission. And then when the house sells, the the money kind of comes out of the attic and it gets all divvied up and it's just kind of built into the price uh, of the home. It's kind of like a Pragu uh, sauce, Italian sauce. It's in there. (laughs) So... um, (laughs) For us, for the younger viewers at home, that, that joke doesn't work, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's what's, you know, the, the, the basis of the lawsuit really is that yeah. they've created this framework. But if, if it's always been that way, then I'm just a realtor operating within that environment. So am I guilty? of a crime if I'm operating within the parameters which have been created. I mean, the last time I checked, lawyers are writing our purchase agreements and our listing contracts. So it's been run by lawyers. So it all seems legit. You know, as a realtor, it seems like, okay, this is the way it's always been. So I guess it's right. And we're just operating within the environment that was created for us. So that's what's right. kind of tricky. Yeah. Is now that's all disrupted. So now it's like, well, do I even trust who created the parameters which I'm working in NAR? And so I've I've been hearing about alternative MLS systems forming. Wow. To mm. to kind of create their own empires, if you will. And it to me it feels like this could go backwards where you know the beauty of NAR was if you're a real if you're an individual like a consumer looking in Ohio and you live in Minnesota, you can go to realtor.com and you can look at houses for sale in Ohio because they have all the national yeah. uh, local MLSs in their system, right? So yeah. that's always been a really cool thing. Now what, what might happen is you might have the state of Minnesota say, you know what? We don't want to be part of NAR. We don't want to be part of any national anything. We're going to create our own little kingdom and we're going to go back to the phone books with the printouts of the houses in there and you're going to have to come back and get the keys from our brokerage and we're going to make it real difficult and whatever brokerages have the most listings will win. 
you yeah. know, and, and I know, and I think that's going backwards. I, I'm being extreme, yeah. with that, but but you just kind of want to say, you know what, screw y'all. I just want to have my own my own MLS in my own system, and I don't want to be plugged mm-hmm. in anything if you're not going to protect me. You know. Yeah, yeah, and you know, an interesting point. You, you talk about these forms. It sounds like they're just kind of the wild, wild west right now with these buyer agreements and and you're saying they can be anything they want and i, I got to point out that the the current purchase agreement that everybody uses it, 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 there's a standard form it's put out by the i don't know the Minnesota Association of Realtors or something like that yep yeah there there's a standard form everybody uses it they are all identical and none of them are required it is an optional form, but <laughs> everybody has a lot of protection or at least feeling of protection if they use this. It's kind of like, you know, Tessa, for us as home inspectors here in Minnesota, we're not licensed. There's no regulation around yeah. home inspections. But yeah. if you're going to be doing a home inspection, you better follow a standard of practice. Mm-hmm. And there's two of them. There's Ashy and Internachi. They're very similar. But if you're doing a home inspection, you better follow that standard of practice. Otherwise, you're just making something up and you're just doing your own thing. And it feels like it's kind of the same way for realtors. If you're going to write a purchase agreement, you're surely going to use the standard form that everybody else uses. It was written by attorneys. It's vetted. Everybody knows it. Everybody agrees to it. But now you got this new thing, this buyer agreement, and there is no uniformity, no standard. It's brand new. and I mean, don't, Michael, don't you think a year from now we're going to have a pretty standard form that everybody's using? Well, I disagree with what you said. It is standard. Um, it, it's a standard it? form. It's not, you know, so, and this is the thing we have to keep in mind. This is a state by state thing. So how I do business in Minnesota is very different than Texas and Florida, California, Minnesota has actually been ahead of all this for many, many years. Okay. We've actually had in our buyer rep agreement that the buyer could be on the hook to pay the buyer's brokerage commission in the event that the seller doesn't do mm-hmm. that. I actually had a client uh, find a house on Craigslist. It, it, there was no MLS. It was Craigslist, right? I didn't know if I was going to get paid. And, and I had shown this particular uh, buyer probably like 30, 40 homes. So it would be nice to get paid for my time. But you know what? They found this house on Craigslist. And I, and I asked them, you know, what do you want to do? And they said, you know what? We feel you're worth the standard, you know, I, I, let's say a 2.73%. They paid me like a 3% commission on the sale. And, and, and they came out of their pocket and they gladly wrote mm-hmm. the check because they got representation. They got an inspection. Um, in fact, you guys did the inspection. And we right. found some real interesting things with this particular home. But they were very happy to have me in their camp. So, yeah. so buyers, in some cases, are willing to pay this fee. And, and hopefully they will. But there's going to be cases where they can't. And quite honestly, some of the realtors are going to have to do some charity work in some cases and just maybe not make any money or get creative with the offer that they make and, you know, just chalk it up to community service, you know? Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a big shift. Yeah, but it is standard. There are standard forms. Our Minnesota forms are barely any different than what they were before. There's, there's just a little bit of new language in there because we've been really ahead of the curve. I mean, our, our local uh, MAR and uh, North Star MLS that I'm part of, they've done just a wonderful job uh, of keeping us out of trouble. And, you know, I think our forms are great. I, I use our forms. You know, real estate school, they say you can you know, write an offer on a napkin but we have a compliance officer that reviews all of our uh, sales that we turn in. And I don't think she'd accept uh, an offer on a napkin mm-hmm. because these forms keep us realtors out of trouble. They're written by lawyers and and they do a really good job. I think, you know what, trying to 
kind of just understand what's going on, I I could uh, equate it to, you know, um, lots of countries don't necessarily, um, like you don't tip your waiter, or you don't tip, like you get a cup of coffee and you don't give a tip, you just pay for it. When people come to the US, they're like, oh my gosh, I have to pay an extra 20% tip on this? Like what is going on? And it's kind of like, you know, when you go to pay for something these days, a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll spin the machine around, you put your card in it and it'll start at like, you know, 18, 20 or 22% yeah. and you just click on that. And you, if you were someone who didn't understand our process, um, you'd look at that and think that you had to choose 18 or 20 or 22. You didn't realize that you could just, you could even opt out if you wanted to, or you could choose a lower percentage. It seems like that's kind of how the real estate industry has worked for a long time. It's just with this kind of assumed commission rate that was, you know, just people didn't even realize that it was technically you could negotiate it, but it never got negotiated. You would just, you know, agree to this 6% or 7% or whatever it was. And it just happened. And now this lawsuit is telling buyers and sellers, like, you don't have to pay that. You never did. Don't you think there's going to be a lot of sellers that are like, I'm not paying, I'm not paying the buyer's agent and I'm not going to pay my, like my agent even, you know, 3% that if they're selling a million dollar house, you know, they're like, okay, well, I'll, I'll pay them 1%. Do you think that there's going to be a lot of people that are just going to almost kind of revolt (laughs) against the system and real estate agents will have to kind of almost start competing against each other to offer competitive pricing structures so they, they don't run out of business? I mean, so far, I haven't had any problems with getting compensated. And, you know, I, I guess there'll be a day where maybe I won't. I don't know. But no, I don't I don't really think it's going to impact us that greatly. I, there probably need to be another wave of lawsuits, probably is what's going to happen. And they're going to keep tightening things up. Because people are going to figure out ways around the way that this is, is created. So, for example, um, we're not supposed to advertise a buyer agent commission or buyer broker commission on the MLS. But I can outside of the MLS. So I just got an email before I got on this call that said, hey, Michael, uh, there's a property at Yakety Yak Street. And we're offering a 2.7% buyer's uh, brokerage commission. So you, there's ways okay. around the system. Okay. And so it's just going to create a lot of creativity. Yeah. For the brokers, agents. And at the end of the day, a buyer or seller doesn't have to use who they're talking to. They can, they can use anyone that will give them what they want, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think like for me, I'm expecting to make a certain amount of money. And if my client doesn't want to pay me that, they don't have to use me. I'm not holding a gun to their head. They do not have to use me. There's Mm -hmm. no forced anything to use me. That's what's a little frustrating about the lawsuit is that commission has always been negotiable. And most people have been okay with it. I mean, you guys have bought and sold real estate probably. Mm -hmm. And you're maybe living in a house and everything is fine. Right? So... Did you overpay a realtor for whatever you paid? I don't know. I mean, I had a client, he just sold his place and he just paid cash for this next place. He's happy as heck. And yeah. he paid, uh, you know, quote unquote, a regular commission. Well, it, so, it, you know, it seems like, it seems like commissions are all over the place. Like, I mean, Michael, you talk about, this client where you showed them 30 to 40 houses and they finally bought one. And let's say, let's say they bought some $200,000 town home and you got 3%. Um, I don't think you got paid well at all there. I think that's horrible (laughs) money for your time. And that's, that's terrible. But on the other hand, um, you get some other fancy buyers who, find a property online and they're like, yep, this is what we want. Michael, we want you to represent us. Can can you go help us take a look? Yep. This is it. And it's a $3 million house and you're getting 3% commission. Like that's great. You're really getting paid well for your time. And then there's everything in between. And I've always thought that the 3% seems a little goofy because I mean, it's like, I, well, tell me this, maybe I'm wrong, but what what would you prefer, Michael? Would you prefer 3% of a $200,000 townhome 
Or would you like 1% of a $1 million house? Now, Let's do math. <laughs> well, with the $1 million house, you're definitely getting paid a lot more. Let me more. do math, Ruben. I, I, well, I you're, you're getting more. Down here and uh, <laughs> start adding and subtracting here. Okay, continue. But, but, but you're, you're getting significantly more for the million dollar house, even though you're getting a much lower commission. But the assumption... The 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 assumption here has to be that if you're selling a million dollar house, it's going to be way more work than a two hundred thousand dollar house. You deserve to be paid maybe five times as much because the price is five times as much. Your commission is going to be five times as high with our traditional model of three percent flat across the board, but. Is it really five times as much work? If you're selling a $5 million house, is it 15 times as much work? Or, or this should, it be a sliding, should it be a sliding scale? Is yeah, what yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it right what we've always done? And I mean, I don't yeah. know. I can see cases where it works out really well and cases where it's really horrible for you. I'll, yeah. I'll turn it back on to you. Um, so... Let's say you're inspecting a million dollar home and you're inspecting a $200,000 home. Let's say you as an inspector uh, dam up the tub upstairs and it, and it floods the house. What's going to cost you more to take care of the problem? Oh, the, the, the house expensive the house for sure. Right. Much more expensive finishes. And you got people who are going to lawyer up at the drop of a hat <laughs> and... I mean, yeah, it's it's way more of a hassle on those houses, but we don't charge based on the price of the house. We only charge based on the size and age. I mean, maybe we should. Right. It's a good so argument I, for charging oh, by the by the price. So where I'm kind of going with this is, and this is something that realtors don't even talk about, and brokers don't talk about, it, and they need to talk about it. Is there is an element of errors and omissions insurance that's involved in every transaction? Okay. So if I get involved with a million dollar home, I have a million dollars more liability um, compared to nothing, right? Yeah. If something goes wrong or sideways or an easement didn't get disclosed or an encroachment or something, me personally and my brokers, we're on the hook for a potential larger problem on a million dollar home than a $200,000 home. So. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that's kind of what, why the, the compensation is there um, is to cover some of that because the liability is increased. The more the more expensive the home, the liability can be increased okay. more. That's a generality, but yeah. that's kind of some of my thinking. And and we don't get into talking errors and omissions insurance to buyers and sellers and that sort of thing. I think maybe we should talk more about what are all the fees that we have as realtors and brokerages? I mean, we have staff that has to process all this stuff. We have a compliance officer that keeps all of us out of trouble, including buyers and sellers and realtors. So yeah. there's a lot of expenses that go into owning a brokerage. And, you know, that's kind of part of all the commission. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to monetize. It's hard to monetize that and say, well, this percentage of the percentage is going towards paying our compliance office or something, you know, yeah. it, 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 it doesn't add up like that. And so it's been just easier in our industry just to kind of keep things negotiable, but within a range that's acceptable, you know? Yeah. So do you think that the percentage of the property price being paid to the buyer's agent do you think that's going to stick around as the norm as years go on? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a loaded question, Ruben. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. I'll ask you in a year. You know, it's we'll negotiable forever. You know, it, 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 it could get negotiated down as, as houses increase in value. Uh, commissions necessarily haven't gone down. I mean, you. I, when I first got in the business, it was pretty common to charge 7%. It's kind of come down to 6%. But then I've also had, um, I've had contracts where it's a variable commission, where if I get X, we charge this. If I find the buyer's 
uh, I would charge this. So we used to have, we used to be able to do variable commissions. We can't do that anymore either. Mm -hmm. So I talked about choose your own adventure. You can only do so much of that in the contract, um, you know, with the seller, they, they have to agree to what adventure they want to go on, but you can't say, you know, this is the range of what it's going to be charged. It has to be very specific. This is what's being charged. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I, you know, the conspiracy theorist in me, um, <laughs> it feels like some of the powers that be don't want to see realtors make as much compensation. They want us to move more towards a, a Zillow or Redfin model where you hit a button and someone shows up that's being paid an hourly rate and they show you the house. And if you want to do a contract, it's a flat rate deal and it's in and out. It's Uh amazon.com. Boom, 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 boom. And because anytime there's money, there's someone behind the scenes trying to take it away from you and and make it easier for people. And is that in the buyer's or seller's best interest? You know, maybe it could be if you're a real savvy buyer and you know what you're doing, that might that model might work great. But if you're a first time home buyer and you know nothing about real estate and you're dealing with a ten dollar an hour uh, showing agent potentially um, and they don't know what they're doing. I don't know. That to me is creating a lot of liability for that buyer that. Yeah. You know, no, Hopefully no. they get a good home inspection. <laughs> well, you know they're not going to test. Their, their $10 an hour agent is going to say, hey, look, I know the cheapest home inspector out there. These guys will do it for one ninety nine, any size house. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, that's just what it feels like. You know, it's it's like what Amazon did to the book industry. You know, they, they make it easy. You can go there, you can buy a book, and it shows up on your doorstep that day. You know, they, and so a lot of booksellers went out of business. So this, this lawsuit, and as it plays out, you know, it it could impact some of the smaller brokerages. I mean, I I know some lenders that have gone out of business just because the business isn't there. So, you know, it, it may become more of a, you know, there's three or four players that run the whole industry and that's it. It's, you know, some of the big nationals and that's it, you know, but. But now we're getting into antitrust stuff again, right? Now it's an oligopoly. We have three companies running yeah. one entire industry. Um, we're yeah. right now we have a lot of boutique shops that are brokerages. We have large nationals. You know, um, there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of options for people. I I think consumers have a lot of choices right now on what to do with their selling side and buying side. You know, it's really up to you. Yeah. What what level of service do you want? It's it's do you want the McDonald's hamburger or do you want the Manny's steak? Yeah. yeah. Nope. We talk about that with the home inspection industry too a lot, Michael. It's like, the, you know, there's yeah. a variety of quality out there. And so just as a consumer, what what matters to you? Um, and it sounds like it's the same thing kind of with real estate now too. It's, you know, you, you get what you pay for potentially. And it's up to you to negotiate with your agent to get on the same page and figure out what works best for you guys. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Cool. Well, Michael, really appreciate you coming on the show. Good insight. I feel like I, I've got a much better understanding of how all this works now. I, uh, I, I appreciate your insights. And it, it'd be interesting to see where we go a year from now, what, where the landscape changes, or if it doesn't. Uh, that, it could be that too. But if, if people want to reach out to you directly, Michael, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, my cell phone is 952-400-7000. And then my website is hometwincities.com. Cool. All right, appreciate it. We'll have a link to those. Uh, We'll have that published in our show notes, just in case anybody missed it or doesn't want to write it down and drive in or something. Go to the show notes. And if you have any thoughts from me or Tessa, comments, questions, concerns, ideas for another show, whatever, please email us. It's podcast at structuretech.com. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.